happy little games. Evil. Since the dawn of time, there has been a constant struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Just take a look throughout history and you will see the various nefarious beings that have brought death and destruction to our world. Names such as Genghis Khan, Hitler, Stalin, and even my wife. But one of the most evil villains to ever grace our earth would have to be Vlad the Impaler. He was the real-life inspiration for Bram Stoker's 1897 epic novel Dracula and is the primary antagonist in the series we are talking about today, Castlevania. Why did the original developer choose a whip as the main weapon for your character? What were the differences between the Japanese and USA versions? So grab your crucifix and don't forget the garlic! This is the history of Castlevania Part 1. It's a bit tricky to pinpoint exactly who came up with the actual concept of the game, but going back to 1985, Konami developer Hitoshi Akamatsu was probably our best bet. At the time, Konami producers were forbidden to include the names in the credits of their games that they had created for fear of other companies stealing them away. Over the last 35 years, he has come forward and shared a few details about the creation of this game. He had grown up loving the Universal Monster flicks, which included the usual cast of characters such as the Mummy, the Wolfman, Frankenstein's monster, and of course, the Prince of Darkness himself, Dracula. He didn't just love the original movies in the series, but also loved the spin-offs as well, including Son of Frankenstein and Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. He wanted to design a game where people would feel as if they were actually in a horror movie, and in my opinion, he pulled this off perfectly. His love of these classic movies ran deep, with the character name of Alucard being lifted straight from the 1943 movie, Son of Dracula. Mr. Akamatsu loved western films as did most of the game designers in Konami's offices, specifically Raiders of the Lost Ark. He thought the whip was very effective with the type of story he wanted to tell, so he decided to give it to the main character. Mr. Akamatsu was very concerned with the controls and wanted to make sure they were synced up as tight as possible with the character animation. He had wanted the whip to feel like an extension of the character's body. The game was initially developed for the Famicom Disk System in Japan under the name Akumaho Dracula. It was changed to Castlevania for the Western release because the title literally translated into Devil's Castle Dracula, and the bosses at Konami did not like the satanic overtones. <laughs> Castlevania was released in 1987 in North America. The game takes place across six levels of run and whip action. As the story goes, you take on the role of Simon Belmont, who was a descendant of the Belmont clan, a family of vampire killers who for centuries have taken down the ultimate vampire himself. You make your way to Transylvania and fight your way through Dracula's castle encountering all sorts of supernatural baddies such as skeletons, ghosts, Medusa, and even a skeleton dragon. Some of the mini bosses you encounter are Frankenstein's monster in Igor, the Grim Reaper, the Mummy, and finally Dracula himself among others. Your whip is your primary weapon and goes by the name of Vampire Killer, which was passed down through the Belmont clan to take out each version of Dracula, who just happens to resurrect every 100 years. The A button allows you to jump, but you cannot change direction in midair, so everything has to be pretty precise. 
Pressing the B button will let you crack that whip, taking out any and everything all around you. Littered throughout the levels are breakable candles which will give you hearts, power-ups, and point bonuses. Along with your trusty vampire killer, you do have a few sub-weapons you can pick up. There are daggers which are just the weakest in my opinion. A tilted boomerang which looks suspiciously like a cross, just don't tell Nintendo. Holy water, which any self-respecting vampire hunter should have at least a gallon of, can be thrown on the ground and allows multiple hits to be given to the enemy. An axe, and also a stopwatch which will momentarily freeze everything on screen. There are various secret items behind walls that you can break with your whip, so be on the lookout for those. The difficulty is perfectly balanced, with the gameplay gradually getting harder and harder the further into it you get. Something else that is fantastic is the music, which sets the mood perfectly for an old creepy monster movie-like vibe. The music was composed independently by Satoe Tirashima, and Kanuyo Yamashita, with the title track of Vampire Killer being reused in numerous sequels ever since. For an early NES title, the game is definitely a must play, especially if you are a fan of the old school monster flicks. It was ported to a number of home computers as well, and I will cover them at the end of the video, so stay tuned if you like that sort of thing. At the same time the original was being developed for the Famicom Disk System, a version was put out for the MSX2 computer entitled Vampire Killer. While the story and enemies are pretty much the same, this is not a straight up conversion of the Nintendo Classic. The gameplay is more linear and features labyrinth like stages where you have to seek out the skeleton key to unlock the door and exit each stage. Due to the limitations of the MSX2 hardware, the screen doesn't scroll but uses a flick screen technique instead. This, however, does not hinder the gameplay at all, and everything does feel really nice. The graphics are given a bit of an upgrade as well, with more colors being used throughout the game. The music is very good, although not quite up there with the NES original. Not only can you break candles and walls to reveal items, you can also purchase them through merchants hidden throughout the levels. There are other power-ups not included in the original NES title, such as limited and vulnerability, increased speed, and jumping height and energy. It's a fun little entry in the series that the Western market didn't get a chance to experience. With the light RPG elements added, you can tell this is where the series was headed when Castlevania II debuted on the NES. Castlevania II Simon's Quest was released in 1987. This time you take on the role of Simon Belmont who has to go on a journey to undo a curse put on him by Count Dracula at the end of the first game. To do this you have to find Dracula's body parts which have been scattered all over Transylvania. Return them to the castle and burn them. It's good old fashioned family friendly entertainment. Similar to Vampire Killer on the MSX, the game adds more RPG elements making it one of the first American released Metroidvania style games that we would see in the wildly successful Castlevania Symphony of the Night. You start out the game with a standard whip which can be upgraded to a chain and finally a flaming whip for maximum damage. The sub weapons are also back including daggers, crystals, and holy water. 
Since the gameplay is non-linear, it features a world map which you can explore and revisit at any time. You can talk to villagers who may offer helpful advice or just flat out lie to you. There are also merchants you can visit to purchase items or access to hidden areas. For each enemy you kill, you gain valuable experience points which will increase your maximum health. Another unique addition is night and day cycles where more powerful enemies will appear during the nighttime hours. While the game doesn't appear to be as difficult as the original, it's still challenging and you will probably have to make your own map because a lot of the scenery appears to be very similar. For me personally, I like the more straight up action of the first game but I can appreciate the RPG elements that were introduced here. Besides, anything that inspires Symphony of the Night is A-OK -okay with me. There was a bit of controversy surrounding the magazine Nintendo Power and this game. The September 1988 edition showed Simon Belmont on the cover holding up a severed head of Dracula. A lot of parents wrote in and complained that this was too disturbing for their children. And looking at the image now, I would have to agree. In the 1980s and the 1990s, Konami had numerous arcade hits and were considered one of the best in the industry. They decided to take Castlevania and bring it into the arcades creating a whole new adventure with improved graphics and sound. The game was entitled Haunted Castle and was released in 1987. The game plays very similar to the original Castlevania with your character using a whip as his primary weapon. By defeating certain enemies, you can upgrade your primary weapon to a Morning Star and then finally to a sword. You also have sub weapons to pick up just like in the original such as a boomerang, bombs, stopwatches and crosses among others. There are six stages in total with the usual assortment of ghosts and goblins to get rid of including skeletons, hunchbacks and zombies. At the end of each stage there is a boss fight and you will encounter Medusa, Frankenstein's monster and finally Dracula. The sprites are large and in charge and the animation is nice and smooth. The music is fantastic and really sets the mood for each level. This was a fairly successful arcade game in Japan but it didn't make much of a dent over here in the states. Most people did not even get the Castlevania connection due to the different name. Some people have complained that the gameplay is a bit too slow but I thought it was perfectly fine. It never received any home conversions but in 2017 it was released on the PlayStation Network as part of the Arcade Archives collection. In 2019 it was also released as part of Konami's Arcade Classics Anniversary Collection and it was released for Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, and PC. In 1989, the series made its debut on the Game Boy with a title simply called The Castlevania Adventure. It starts off very similar to the original, only this time you're not playing as Simon Belmont but as his ancestor Christopher. He does brandish his trademark whip but the first thing you notice when playing is there are no sub weapons. There are candles to destroy but they only hold score bonuses for the most part. It is possible to upgrade your whip but if you take a hit you will lose that upgrade which is just a tad bit frustrating. There are four levels in total and you only have three lives to use. The gameplay itself is extremely slow and plodding. 
The original Game Boy had a problem with screen blur if the scrolling was too fast for the screen to keep up. Perhaps they did this intentionally to keep the blur at a minimum. The audio was really good with excellent music and sound effects throughout. I had this back in the day and enjoyed it especially on road trips with my family. In 1990, we received Castlevania III Dracula's Curse for the NES. Since Konami figured this was probably their last Castlevania game on the 8-bit Nintendo, they decided to go all out and put everything they could into the game. For starters, it ditches the RPG and action-adventure elements of Simon's Quest and returns it to the platforming elements found in the first game. There are 15 levels in total and 4 different characters you can play as. It also includes a password system as well as 4 slightly different endings. There are also multiple paths throughout the game making for a much more varied experience. The game is a prequel where you take on the role of Trevor Belmont, who is in possession of the Vampire Killer and have to take down Count Dracula. Along your quest, you have three possible companions, but only one can accompany you at any given time. You can play as them by pressing the select button. Your three compadres are a sorceress, pirate, and Dracula's son. Each of your traveling willberries have different abilities. You do get a slightly different ending depending on which companion you complete the game with. The graphics and animation are fantastic and easily the best on the NES hardware. The backgrounds with their rotating gears and swinging pendulums in particular are very impressive for a 1990 8-bit NES game. Not to beat a dead horse, but the music and sound effects are absolutely fantastic. The best in the series on the original NES in my opinion. The game did have some censorship with Medusa now brandishing a shirt and topless statues also finding the time to cover up their assets. All religious imagery such as crosses were also removed. In 1991, Konami released Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge for the Game Boy. This is a great follow-up to the original Game Boy title with you once again taking on the role of Christopher Belmont as he sets out on a quest to rescue his son from the clutches of the dastardly Count Dracula. This game takes place across four levels including Crystal, Cloud, Plant, and Rock. Quite a bit different than the standard castles and forests of the previous Castlevania games. Similar to the Mega Man series, you can play through these levels in any order you like. Another welcome addition to the portable entry is the reappearance of the sub-weapons, although this time around you only get two. The Holy Water and the Axe. In the Japanese version, the Axe is replaced with a cross. The Vampire Killer can be upgraded to a Flaming Whip, but thankfully it can't be downgraded for the most part. The graphics and animation are good and a little bit of a step up from the previous game. Control-wise, it feels great and has that distinct NES Castlevania feel. There is also a handy password feature which makes the game just a little bit more enjoyable.
それは世にも恐ろしい Also in 1991, Castlevania entered the 16 bit dimension with Super Castlevania 4 on the Super Nintendo. Released just a few months after the debut of the extremely sexy, very nice Super Nintendo, the game puts on an audio visual clinic with its mode 7 backgrounds and fast and furious gameplay. As far as the story goes, this is essentially a remake of the original game with Dracula rising from his grave and you having to take him down. The game takes place across 11 levels instead of 6 as found in the original game. The first thing you notice upon starting up the game are the large and in charge detailed sprites in all the lovely colors. The levels are extremely detailed and are really just a means of showing off the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 hardware, and they look absolutely stunning. A lot of the more innovative features of the third game, such as branching paths and multiple characters, are missing, with the game going back to its roots found in the original game. The designer of the game, Masahiro Yuno, had wanted to include these options in the game but did not have enough time to implement them. Thankfully, the password function still remains. The music and sound effects are like melted butter, nice and smooth on your eardrums. It creates a perfect atmosphere and should be experienced just for the audio alone. The controls are a little bit different, with Simon being able to whip in all directions, which really comes in handy. You can also attach your whip and swing across chasms similar to Indiana Jones. This is an excellent entry into the series, especially considering it was the very first one of the 16 bit era. In 1993, for the X68000 computer line, Akumaho Dracula was released. The game at its core is the original Castlevania, only redesigned to take full advantage of the more powerful CD ROM based hardware. There are eight levels in total with some familiar stages, but a lot of them have been redesigned. Every sub weapon from the original game is made available, but there is one brand new one. Which is an herb that can refill your health meter with six blocks used. The gameplay is very similar to the original NES version, although this time you can actually control Simon in mid jump. The X68000, for those of you who don't know, was known for having very faithful arcade ports, and it uses this hardware to really make the game shine. While it doesn't use the gimmicky special effects of the Super Nintendo hardware, It does feature excellent animation and some of the best pixel artwork around. It also includes a new intro and ending. Some of the music tracks have been reused, such as Vampire Killer, but everything has a symphonic feel thanks to the CD ROM format. It is definitely a treat for your ears, and if you are a Castlevania fan, you should seek it out just to experience it for yourself. When I first started dabbling in emulators, this was the game people would talk about and how much better it was than any other version of Castlevania on the market. The problem was, every X68000 emulator was in Japanese and was very difficult to use. Thankfully, the game was released as part of the Castlevania Chronicles here in the States with a number of brand new features. Not only do you get the original mode, but also an arranged mode, new CGI movies, redesigned character sprites, and more. There were also multiple difficulty levels, which gives the little bitty babies a fighting chance at taking down Count Dracula. One thing of note that when you fight on the clock tower level in the original X68000 version, 
it would be synced up with the internal clock of the machine to show the proper time. Since the PlayStation does not have an internal clock, you can change this by entering the Konami code and accessing a hidden menu. A neat little feature to be sure. Also released in 1993 for the PC Engine Super CD format was Dracula X Rondo of Blood. At the time of this game's release, most CD-ROM based titles were essentially standard games with added audio and cutscenes, but this one takes it to a whole new level. You take on the role of Richter Belmont who has to rescue his significant other Annette who has been kidnapped by Dracula. This was the first Castlevania game to encourage exploring along with branching paths. There are eight levels in total which does not sound like a lot but each stage has at least one branching path which if you manage to find them all brings the total up to 13. Dracula has also kidnapped four maidens and if you want to see the best ending in the game you have to rescue all four of them. Your primary weapon once again is the whip and you have six sub items to use this time around, including all of the previous ones as well as a Bible which will throw pages at the enemy. Another new feature is the item crash which are super attacks for each of your weapons that use a handful of hearts at once and unleash a flurry of items for several seconds. The graphics and animation are very good with extremely detailed backgrounds and loads of special effects. The bosses themselves are sometimes four or five times larger than your character and look fantastic. Thanks to the increased storage space of the CD-ROM, a lot of different enemy types appear with some of them only showing up once or twice throughout the whole game. The game has a definite anime feel more than a gothic old school monster flick vibe as found in the original game. This is also evident in the game's soundtrack which is not quite as dark and gothic as previous ones. It still sounds great but more in line with anime at the time. The gameplay is typical Castlevania 1 fare which means the directional whipping is gone but you do get a very cool backflip maneuver. The whip itself is also fully powered up from the get go. You can also play as Maria Renard after you rescue her and she will join you in your supernatural fight. Since she is smaller, she is much more nimble and has different attacks as well. Playing through the game as Maria is essentially playing through on easy mode which is great for new players of the series. US audiences finally got a chance to play this game when it was released for the PSP in 2007 as part of the Castlevania X Chronicles. Due to the sheer volume of Castlevania games that were released, this video had to be split into multiple parts. I hope you enjoyed part 1 and please stay tuned for part 2 on the history of Castlevania. If you liked this content, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you so much for watching.